Perfect. Uh, so, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Uh, Jamie today is going to walk us through mastering prototyping in Figma. So basically he's going to show us everything from basic to some really cool uh, and advanced tricks. So like the audience for this, you can be a beginner, but you can also be like, a, you will also be intermediate level. Uh, it's suitable for everyone basically. Just one second, we have Tara as well joining us. Um, Jamie has shared their, the working file as well. So this session should be interactive. Um, you can work with Jamie while he's showing you things around. Uh, he's also here to answer any questions. We have 15, 20 minutes at the end of the session for him to answer any, any questions he will have. And then, uh, yeah, that's all from my side. Jamie, I'm, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Um, Thank you so much for, for accepting this invite and for showing and basically sharing your knowledge with everyone here. Oh, thanks, Valentina. Um, so just uh, I've, I've shared a link to the design file. There's only mm -hmm. one snag that I couldn't quite work out, which is it's just view only for now, because uh, to access the variables and advanced prototyping features, you need to be on a, a team plan. And the only team plan I happen to have is in my work library, so I cannot give anyone access to that for now. Um, but I will, I will figure this out and share a version that you can play around with yourself. And all the examples that we've worked on will be available in that file. Um, so I'm just going to share my Figma window. So uh, the goal of today's workshop is really about prototyping. Um, it's a little bit about design as well. So if you're somewhat familiar with Figma and you have a reasonable grip over it, but you're finding uh, maybe some design things uh, are troubling you or some prototyping things, particularly as things get more complex, I'm hoping this will be very useful for you. Um, so my day-to-day -day job, uh, I'd be using Figma quite a bit. Um, I do work with a company called SimLocal. And part of, one of our product offerings is that we have a, a white label shop product. So I would be using Figma a lot to not only prototype flows, but to set up larger scale white labeled uh, outputs. Um, so I've spent, I've done my time in Figma. I spent an awful lot of time in it. Uh, and I'm hoping that the stuff that kind of took me weeks to figure out um, will be kind of stuff I can share with you and, and make it nice and obvious. Uh, I'm only going to be able to cover kind of the tip of the iceberg, so to say, because Figma is getting more and more complex. It's getting pretty intense in parts. Um, so I put together what I think is a good basic set of prototyping basics and some design stuff. If you have any particular questions, I have uh, set aside some time at the end, and I'm more than happy to stay on if you have any specific things you'd like to share. Um, and feel free to stop me if something just isn't making sense or it's not communicating. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can find me in the UX3 Slack group. If you're part of that group, you can also find me on LinkedIn at my name, or you can just contact me directly. So I'm at jamieryan.ie or by email jamie at jamieryan.ie, and I check my email religiously. So uh, I guess to start off, um, maybe to get a bit uh, meta or philo philosophical, what is a prototype exactly? And I suppose we know what a prototype is, but what is the function of a prototype? Um, and I don't know why, but I, I immediately thought of this scene when I was thinking of prototypes and, and kind of the idea of something pretending to be something else. So I don't know if you've seen The Wizard of Oz, but basically there's a scene at the end where they, they go to meet the wizard and he appears as this really scary, daunting figure that's projected on the wall. And then they find out that um, he's actually a little man behind a door controlling all these knobs. and and making something look like something else. So he's making himself look like this giant big thing. And I guess in a sense, that's kind of what prototyping is about. So prototyping is a mean, it's sort of a means to an end um, to take an idea from a, a, a static sketch to more of a moving sketch. Um, and I guess uh, there was another thing that I, I read just today actually that I thought was really uh, nice, which is um, a prototype is an answer. And so a prototype is usually an answer to a question that you're you're trying to get an answer for. It may not be the right answer, it's just a answer. Um, and often what we're using prototypes for is to quickly communicate that idea to someone in a way that's easier than just words. Um, so why do we prototype? Well, we might be prototyping for ourselves to better understand the interactions between screens or the interactions between elements. 
Um, prototyping can give us a feel for how something might work in reality more than just static screens. We might realize that something needs to scroll, something needs to expand. And prototyping gives us a way to look at that in context in a rapid uh, manner without having to contact development or code it ourselves. It's really good for getting stakeholder buy-in. So typically when you're working with business stakeholders, screens are always great, but a prototype can really bring a vision together. And if you're communicating a big picture idea or you're trying to figure out if something will land, a prototype is a great way to communicate what that might actually look like in practice. And I, I personally find prototypes really useful when I'm working with developers. So often we're sharing screens and specifications with developers, but sometimes showing something in motion, showing some animation can really uh, take that idea to the next level and get everyone on board. And particularly when you're looking at specific interactions or micro interactions, really a prototype helps to show exactly what your vision is and make sure that's fully understood by the people you're working with. So Figma is a tool for prototyping. There are, of course, many, many ways you can prototype, but Figma is generally a pretty nice tool. And there's some reasons why it's particularly good for getting a quick prototype together. So it's obviously quite fast. If you know what you're doing, uh, you can get a prototype together in seconds, literally. And you can use all of your design library components. You can pull community components. You don't need to build from scratch necessarily in Figma to make a prototype that uh, works. And then with a prototype link, you can share that out to anyone and it will open up in the way that you wish uh, them to view it. And if there's something wrong with that prototype, uh, you can fix it on the fly. And if someone's on that prototype, it will actually be edited while they're looking at it. And this is a really powerful feature that sets Figma apart from a lot of other tools. And then it's just innately presentable. So again, when you share a prototype with someone, Provided that you set it up right, they're going to be able to open it up in their browser. They don't have to install a special tool or a plugin. Uh, it's going to work on their side. So it's great for uh, it's great for sharing with stakeholders or sharing with other people. And you know they're going to get what you're trying to communicate. Some downsides, and some of these are becoming less of a downside as Figma develops. Um, prototypes are not inherently responsive. <clears throat> there are, I've discovered some weird hacks to make a prototype responsive, but they're distinctly hacks. Uh, and so when you design a prototype, you're really aiming for one screen type and you don't want to deviate from that too much or to disorientate people using that prototype. And um, the outputs, uh, or the inputs, I should say, they're somewhat static. Now that changed a little bit recently when variables were introduced. So now Figma has a little bit of logic and we'll cover that later. But you, if your prototype depends on a lot of dynamic text inputs or data handling, you might want to consider something else if you need something at a higher fidelity. It can be time consuming. It doesn't have to be time consuming, but you do have to be conscious of what matters when you're building a prototype. I've seen people trying to cover every single screen, every single interaction, and that's really a time sink. A prototype, as I said, is an answer and it should be answering a specific question. And I find prototypes work best when they're really focused on one particular flow or one idea. As and this is really tailing off the point I just made, the more you put into a prototype, the more complex it becomes. And particularly when you're introducing some of the more advanced features or you're playing with states and logic, it's hard to keep a track of all that. So again, it doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to be time consuming. Once you have specific goals set out and you're more flow focused, prototyping can be quite fast. So I'm not gonna really dive into other examples too much, um, but I am an advocate for using the right tool for the job and Figma is a tool, it's a very good tool, but when Figma isn't suitable, there are alternatives and they're basically at varying degrees of complexity. So I just have some examples here. So ProtoPy is a tool that will take Figma screens. Uh, you can import Figma screens and you can apply things like input uh, forms, conditional logic that goes beyond just simple true or false statements or basic conditions. With ProtoPy, you can do much more advanced prototyping, but it is a lot more time consuming. So you really have to decide whether it's worth doing that versus just building maybe a proof of concept if you're in a team of developers. Um, and then there are Figma to web tools like Framer and uh, Webflow. Um, 
these have plugins or these have import capabilities that are getting better by the day. Webflow in particular has really good integration with Figma, um, but you are looking at more stacks of tools and potentially more prices uh, involved in prototypes. So you really want to make sure that that's what you need. And of course, uh, this is sort of my preferred route, uh, although I'm still learning, is just make the prototype in code. So if you know some basic, particularly for web, if you know some basic HTML, you know some CSS, uh, then it only just takes learning maybe some basic JavaScript or using a library. It sounds intimidating, but it's not. So let's say you have maybe a form that you need to get some actual data from. You can just code that prototype. And I would, I would really advocate for all designers to at least have a fundamental understanding of how uh, web technology works if you're designing for web, or how uh, certain mobile libraries work if you're designing for mobile. But I digress. We, we're not going to go too far down that avenue. But I would always keep your mind open to other options. If you want a prototype to be more simple, maybe Figma isn't the answer. Um, you can use something as simple as PowerPoint. And PowerPoint is a very business-friendly language to communicate in. Just put a few screens and some slides. Maybe you only need to communicate a high-level idea. And you can show the motion in those screens. Or you can just use paper. And in fact, in this notebook, I sometimes sketch out uh, prototype flows. So we we kind of we designers still use pen and paper, and it's still useful if you really want to get something fast, and you maybe don't want to get bogged down with designing elements. Now I've talked about a lot of reasons not to use Figma, but I'm still quite an advocate of using Figma. So I'd say uh, we should just dive into this and get started. And um, so. And oh, and then a side note, a lot of those interactions in that slide deck use prototypes. So uh, you can use you can use basic interactions and things like presentations, not just uh, screen flows. And that can be a nice way of uh, adding some interaction. You can take a look at that file later and just see how I did those. Um, so I don't know how familiar people are with Figma as a whole, but I'll just very briefly go over um, the interface. So. Uh, typically, when you're in Figma, you're in what's called the design panel. And the design panel is up here in the top right. And when you're in the design panel, you have all the standard tools. So if I select a layer, I get all the information in the right panel. I get all the information in the left panel. Um, and everything's available to me by default. And when I, uh, the first thing I would say is before you jump into prototyping, make sure that you've done most of the design work that you need to do. Because when you get into doing prototype flows, you don't want to have to keep jumping back and forth with an incomplete design. Um, how I typically will do a prototype is if I have screens already available, uh, I'll quickly put the relevant screens I need into a page, uh, and then I'll start prototyping. Or if I'm working on a completely new idea, I'll lay out all the screens first, maybe a bit roughly, and then jump into prototyping and start to map out how I think this will work. It always helps to plan out what you're going to do before you do it. Um, so don't start prototyping maybe before you've actually figured out what you're prototyping, right? Because uh, you will end up going back and forth, and you'll end up going, oh, I wish I just spent five more minutes you know, actually thinking about what I'm designing here. And another very important point uh, I would make is do not use your design file as your prototype file. So it might be tempting, and I'll just show you an example. Um, I have This is a file that I'm working on for uh, an app uh, for some local. This is one of the prototype pages. And as you can see, there's there's lots of things going on here. Uh, ironically, this is one of the less complicated prototypes I put together. But this covers all the main page flows. This is not the file I give to developers for when they're designing screens. I keep these in separate pages because I need to communicate a lot of specific information. And I need to communicate different screen sizes. And I need to show things that may not work in a prototype. If you try to mix up a prototype and a design file, uh, you're going to end up confusing things. You're going to end up having random elements strewn about the page that are confusing developers and confusing people who may be working with you on the file. So I would say the first thing you should do when you're making a prototype is create a separate page. And by that, uh, I mean on the left-hand side, on the top left, there's a little area called Pages. You can open up a new page. Um, you can set, call it Prototype. And I always use a little joystick icon to tell everyone, hey, this is a prototype file. This is not a design file. Please press the Play button. Um, that's how I communicate the difference. And there's another reason that we don't mix design files and prototype files. Um, 
which I'll cover in just a moment. Uh, so going back to our example, um, I've just laid out some basic screens here, and I've laid out some basic components. The first thing um, that I want to do when I start prototyping is decide, OK, what, what screen size am I going to use for this prototype? And typically, I would just go for mobile. Um, so the screen sizes themselves are a mobile device size, but you might ask, does it matter what size the screens are for the prototype? And what I would say is there's two things involved here. So you want this, you want at least the width of the screens to be the same, whatever that may be. Um, because if you have different width screens, um, they're going to appear uh, differently as you move throughout the prototype and they're going to start jumping around. There's a really easy way to uh, determine what kind of screen size to use, and that's by using frames. So if you haven't used frames before, uh, frames are sort of like, they're like the top level layer in Figma. They're a bit like artboards if you use any Adobe tools. Frames offer us a way to basically set a standard size and keep everything captured within this box. And so if I press the F key, and you'll see in the bottom left the keys I'm pressing. So uh, as I'm pressing shortcuts, you can see what I'm what I'm doing. Um, when I press the F key, or I click this little, uh, it looks a bit like a hashtag icon, the frame tool pops up. And when I click that, a bunch of these uh, presets pop up on the side. And I would really recommend that when you're prototyping, or even when you're designing uh, for a particular device, that you use these presets where possible. Um, so if I open up this uh, phone panel, I can see there's a lot of presets for different device sizes. Um, I typically go for one of the smallest ones available. And the reason for that is I tend to like to design for the smallest uh, known screen first, and then think of all the bigger cases. And that way, I've kind of covered the extremes. Um, and if I click one of these uh, templates, um, you'll see that a new frame just popped up. And the frame is set up exactly uh, as the dimensions of, in this case, the iPhone 13 mini. Um, and, the, and the other reason I really like using the presets for frames is uh, when you use these presets, they work really well for um, uh, frame displays and prototypes. Um, I'm trying to figure out, is there, is there a term, better term for that? Um, Device, device frame, sorry. Um, so typically, when you start a prototype, um, and you can open up a, a view of the prototype anytime by pressing Shift and Space. Um, in this case, you'll notice that my prototype has this phone frame. Um, this, By default, you'll probably have something like none. So if I have none as my device, when I click prototype and I have nothing selected, you can see there's a device panel up here. This is just going to take whatever size uh, of the frame I've selected. So if I click a big box like this, you can see it's trying to it's fitting this uh, it's fitting this square screen into this frame. I can resize this by the way because there's no constraints here. That's kind of what I also what I mean by like don't don't jump between different frame sizes because you're going to end up like this. But the problem that, again is like I have different heights here, and when I click different heights for these frames, I'm noticing that. Um, depending on the frame, I'm, I'm kind of getting different views or different sizes. If I drag it down, see, I can see there's more on the screen, but I don't really know where the boundaries end. If I if I select a preset frame size, and I also select the matching device, so in this case, iPhone 13 mini, now uh, it's always going to be this size. So even if I resize the frame itself, it's keeping the ratio of that screen, or it's keeping the constraint of that screen. So if I select a particularly long screen, um, like this, um, let's say this shop screen, by default, it's going to show what's inside that frame. And I can't just drag it down and expand it. And that's more representing what it will actually look like on the phone. Um, so I would say use the, use the frames that come with Figma and use the device templates. And that way, when you go to present a prototype, and you can always present a prototype by clicking the play button up here, by default, it will take that frame that you've decided to use. So when you're showing this to other people, they actually get a representation of what device it should be. This is a really nice way of communicating, oh, hey, this is a mobile prototype, because I can see a mobile screen. Um, and that's, that's kind of the basics of, like, how to make sure that you're using the right device 
portions and the widescreen proportions. Um, so let me just look back at my checklists. Yes, so um, we've covered the frame sizes and the device sizes. Um, you'll notice that when I move from the design panel to the prototype panel, um, there's a few different options I have here. I can also set this to a landscape screen. So not every prototype has to be vertical, it can be landscape. I can set the background of the presentation, but typically you wouldn't set this normally. It's only if you wanna be really groovy, I guess. Um, it's fine just to leave it on black. And then it will say, create a connection and running your prototype. So the basic uh, aspect of making any prototype is creating connections. So when I'm in the design panel, I can't make these connections. If I try to click a frame, I just have uh, I just have design options to edit things in this frame. But when I'm in the prototype mode, when I click a frame um, and hover around the edges of the frame, you can see that there's this little plus icon. And similarly, if I click an element inside the frame, there's also a plus icon. And if I drag this plus icon, I get this little arrow. So in this case, if I drag this onboarding one frame, and the node, and I pull it over here, it's gonna to snap to the next frame. And when I do that, uh, it opens up a prompt. And by default, it's always the first prompt is always going to be on tap. So on tap, navigate to onboarding two. And then it gives me some options um, where it will usually say instant by, by default, but it'll give me a few options here. So basically, this is, basically, this is saying um, from the top to the bottom, what interaction do I want to have here? And there's a bunch of interactions you can use. Uh, when that interaction happens, what happens? Uh, in this case, I'm navigating to another frame. And there's a whole bunch of other options here, which we'll cover. And then how do I want that to look like? Do I want that to be instant? And by default, it is instant. Or do I want it to dissolve, such so as a fade, or smart animate, or a few other options here. And there's also a few uh, extra options here which are quite important to remember and easy to forget, and I'll cover these in a moment. So if you needed to create, if you needed to create a quick frame um, prototype, or a quick a quickie as I call it, um, I would just simply take all the, the steps that you need to take and just go drag this to this, drag this to this, to this, and so on. And I'll actually, I'll darken the screen so you can see it a little more clearly. and then drag this to this. And so um, you'll notice as I started dragging these arrows, another box popped up called flow one. So by default, when you drag that first arrow to another screen, Figma is basically making a guess um, of, okay, you're you probably wanna start your prototype from this frame because this is where you started drawing interactions. Um, by default, that's called flow one. You can call that anything you want. So in this case, I'll just call this quick prototype. And also there's a little uh, icon next to that flow box. So if I click that, it'll just open up the, it'll open up the preview. And again, you can press shift and space to pop this up at any time. It's, it's a really handy feature. So what I've told Figma is um, just for now, uh, when I click each screen, I just want you to move to the next screen. I don't want anything else. So when I, as I click these, you can see, I just move through each screen and then it stops. Um, so that's a basic prototype. That's as basic as it gets. Um, you'll probably wanna do a few more things with that. So let's look back at the start of this. And I just press R to reset the prototype. So at any point, if you've gone down a dead end, you can either click the little refresh icon up here or you can press R. That also works for other people who you're presenting to. So make sure if you're giving a prototype to someone to explain to them that you can press R to reset the prototype if something goes wrong. So that's a basic prototype. We obviously wanna do a little more with our prototype where we wanna create some more interactivity. So let's uh, let's get rid of those interactions. And I can also just drag and uh, select these. I'm just gonna knock, knock them out. I think that's them all. Um, so as we start creating prototypes, and as we start maybe tweaking things as we go along, um, there's a few things to watch out for. Um, and I'll, go, I'll get to those in a moment. So let's say I wanna take this prototype to the next level. There's a few things I might wanna do. I might want interactions to happen at specific um, uh, points. 
So instead of me just clicking the whole screen to continue, I might want I might want it to be that I click a, the next button to continue. And so if I, oh, that's as simple as just clicking that element. And if you can't uh, actively select that element, you can hold the command or control key to get to the lowest level of, of that layer. Um, and for example, an example of that would be if I specifically wanted one element of this zephyr, if I hold the control key, I can actually select the individual dots instead of just selecting the, the whole group. So I click next button here. Again, as I'm dragging, it's giving me the default option and I'm happy enough with that. I'm gonna click uh, next here. I'm gonna click next here. And then when I'm on the shop screen, um, maybe I want this, uh, only the checkout button up here or the shopping cart button up here to take me to the next screen. So seeing, see the way I can't select that element straight away? I can either click into it like this or I can just go in and select the bottom most element. And I can see that it's selected the, the actual lines instead of the icon. So I can press shift enter to jump up an element. And I can see on the left-hand side where I am as well. Um, so I want that to go there. And then I want maybe the Apple Pay button to just take me to the end. So um, very similar to last time, but now, when I try to click anywhere in the screen, it's basically giving me a prompt saying, uh, hey, you know, you have to click this to continue. And again, I can't I can't move around. I can, I can move around the screen. I can interact with it, click away, but it's prompting me to click this. And that's Figma's default behavior. So it will tell you where the interactive spots are. Uh, I believe there is a setting or a, a, a sharing setting that you can turn off these hotspots. But unless you're doing a specific test with the users and you're very confident about your prototype, I would leave these on by default. This gives people a sense of where they can interact with the product and where they can't interact with it and avoid people clicking things that don't have any interactivity. Um, so again, uh, I've now added an extra element to my prototype. Um, so now I'm thinking, what else can I do here? So when when you start getting more into prototypes and um, when you start wanting there to be more uh, interactivity between elements uh, you might consider adding some uh, details like for example for this um, onboarding screen we might want to set a transition so instead when we click next we might want the page to swipe to the next screen uh, like a standard onboarding flow so i don't have to do that interaction again uh, I can see when I when I click uh, out of any active element on the screen, I can see where all my interactions are, and I can click um, I can click this noodle here, and then it opens up the interaction options. Um, but you know what? I've just decided now. Actually, I don't want there to be a next button, so I'm going to get rid of the next buttons here. I want this actually uh, swipe across. Um, so maybe instead of there being a next button. And I can I can make some light touch uh, edits when I'm in prototype mode. So there, I just deleted the buttons. I want it to be so that when I drag across the screen, it's going to swipe to the next uh, screen. And so, if I select this whole frame and I drag it to the next frame, and this time I select instead of on tap, I select on drag. Um, now, when I drag this in some direction, it's going to interact in such a way that the new screen is going to come into view. Um, by default, it gives you options uh, for how it moves in. So I want it to move in. Uh, I think I want it to move in left. Um, and I better just check. Yeah, I had the I had the animation there set to bouncy, which would look a bit wild. Um, so I want this to navigate to this screen, but I want it to be on drag and I want it to move in. So let's just test how that might work. And you'll notice it specifically says now on the screen on drag instead of just showing me a noodle. And that's really helpful when you've got many interactions going on and you might need to see which one is a drag and which one is a tap. So when I go back into my prototype, now when I, uh, I'm holding my mouse down, now when I drag, I can see that it's moving across. And Figma by default has a kind of a snap. So if we don't drag all the way, just like uh, you wouldn't any application, it's not going to drag over. I have to kind of go over halfway for it to drag. And um, so I'm happy with that interaction. Um, I can actually just copy and paste that interaction. So I'll just do that again. This is a relatively new feature. 
if I select this noodle and I press copy, and then I select the next frame and click paste, you can see there's a little uh, arrow that's appeared here. So it's pointing to itself because this original one was pointing this, to the screen, but all I have to do is just pull that out. And now I can have that do the same interaction to the next screen. So that's just a little time saver. You don't have to manually drag to each frame and, and uh, set all your parameters again. If there's an interaction that you want to repeat, you can just copy, uh, select this, copy and paste, which is really handy. And so now if I restart my um, prototype, I drag to the next screen. Oh, why is it not starting on my flow? Let's go here, there we go. Um, so I drag to here, I drag to here, and then I enter the shop. Um, so you have you have some flexibility with the kinds of interactions you can do. And you can also mix interactions. Um, so maybe uh, it's a case of we want the next button to move to this screen, but we also want if someone happens to drag the screen across that they actually just move to the, uh, the um, screen here. So we can go into this uh, frame, um, which we don't have any interaction for, and we can just drag this here, and we can say, undrag, navigate to this screen. So we can see on the screen, if I, if I drag it across, we move to the screen uh, here, but also, um, oops, if I just press next, it'll also do the same thing. So you can mix and match interactions, and you can have different elements at different levels do different interactions, but just be mindful to keep track of what kind of interactions are happening because sometimes conflicts can happen. Um, something that, I, that happens uh, sometimes is um, you'll go to, um, you'll have an element that maybe had, actually I'll do an example. Maybe you have uh, this screen here and maybe you have set it to that by default, it's uh, tap to shop. Um, sometimes you might add an interaction on top of this, forgetting that this tap is already here, and you'll notice that it's not available. So you can't have you can't have two of the same interaction happening, and you'll notice that a lot in components. And we'll get into components in just a second. Um, in fact, let's get into components now. Um, so let me think of a good example of a component. Um, okay, so uh, you'll notice at the bottom I have this little element here. Um, this is just a page navigation. Right now, uh, this isn't a component. Uh, so I've just been sketching this out and I don't have this uh, doing anything right now. Um, I, uh, what, what I've seen people do often is they'll get, a, they'll get an element like this and they'll maybe say uh, home, settings, uh, favorites, uh, log out or log in. Um, and they'll go, great, uh, so I've got this, and now I'm gonna start prototyping where these are gonna go. So I'm gonna select home, and I'm gonna drag here, and then I'm gonna select settings, and drag to settings, and so on and so forth. And the problem with that is, um, because you've done all this interaction on this one particular layer, um, you have to then go to each one of these and set the interactions, and then you're repeating yourself over and over again. Um, this is not a good way to do things. Um, so if you if you happen to have sketched uh, a copy to pay and pasted something like an element like this and you didn't make it a component, there's a really easy way to fix that. Um, so if you go up here, there's a setting called select matching layers. If you click select matching layers, it's gonna select all the instances that are just like this layer. And then if you go to create a select create component, it's going to, uh, make a copy of that component up here and then change all of these layers to an instance of this component. And components and prototypes are really powerful and I'm gonna show you why. If I go to the component and set interactions in the component, so let's say I have my home uh, settings, um, basket or favorites, login, not only have I updated all of the uh, instances, the instances of this component here, uh, I can also set the interactions for all these components. So if I uh, go into this home button here, um, and I either I can either drag that to that noodle, or you can actually find the frame if you've named your frames. 
and click there. And you should always name your frames so you actually know what you're pointing to. Um, I've I've now set it to that home navigates this page. But the thing is, because this is a component and these are instances of the component, when I click this component or click this component, you'll see that, that now they're all pointing to the same thing. Um, and you'll notice if I if I if I go in here, um, it has that interaction already built in, which is really nice. Um, so again, I can just go in here, uh, set this to the settings page, um, set this to the basket or the checkout page. And now uh, when I go into this flow here, uh, these are all interactable elements. Um, there's one thing I deliberately did in this screen as well, um, which is very important in terms of not only prototypes, but how you arrange your design files, is um, this is on a frame, um, but I don't want I, I don't want this thing to be at the bottom way down here. I want this uh, this particular element to be stuck to the bottom of my screen. Um, and of course, I could I could carefully size up the screen, and I could carefully, like if I open up the preview, I could kind of eyeball it and go, yeah, that's roughly there, that's good, and that'll work. Um, the problem is when you get into longer screens like this. Um, if I try to set that uh, on this page like this, I could try put it on top. I'm now um, cutting off the screen just for the sake of fitting this nav bar in, and I can't actually see what I'm doing. Um, the best way to handle this is if I go, if, if there's an element that I want to be fixed to the page uh, when I'm on a prototype, so in, in what I mean is it's stuck to the bottom or the top or the side of the screen, there's two things I want to do then. Um, the first thing is I want to make sure it's it's placed at the in the right part of the frame that I want it to be in. So in this case, I want this to be at the bottom of the frame. I'm not concerned about the size of the screen. Um, the screen can be like, the screen can be this big and it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna place that at the bottom. Uh, I can press option S. So WASD will let you actually move that around really fast. It's the same as using the align buttons up here. I want to set that to the bottom. And then I'm gonna set my constraint to bottom and set the uh, constraint up here to left and right. So what I'm basically telling Figma is, uh, if this frame resizes, I want this to say to follow the bottom of the frame here and follow the left and right of the frame here. And so when I have this frame, I no longer have to worry about where to put that because it's following the frame like this. And there's and if I set another setting here, which in prototype is position, and I set that to fixed, I'm telling Figma, and again, I'll just I'll just show you if I click this element. There's uh, below the interactions panel, there's a scroll behavior panel. If I select this to fix, I'm telling Figma, uh, please keep this in the place that I want it to be. And regardless of what size the frame is, when I go to open the prototype, this could be like this big. Um, that's always going to be at the bottom of the screen. And I don't have to worry about it. And even if I have lots of content here, it's going to understand that this part of the screen is scrolling but this part of the screen always stays fixed at the bottom. And that's a really important thing uh, to remember when you're setting up screens that you're not trying to make life hard for yourself. You're trying to automate your, uh, things. And that's that's really something that I think is important when you're doing more advanced prototypes is don't repeat yourself. Try to, try to set things to come from one action. So if I were to now um, I'll go back to design panel, if I were to now just select all of these and remove them and just select this one and select all the frames I want it to be in and paste it, now it's going to be at the, or it should be at least, oh, maybe not. Um, I might just have to take some work in setting that to the bottom each, of each frame, but now it's going to behave in the same way as I said it. So by going to prototype here, the position is fixed, it's set to the bottom. It will be in the same place on every single page. So for example, on this page where there's a few things going on, you'll notice that the, the bar here is at the bottom, but in the example, it's um, it's staying to the bottom of the screen. So often in prototypes, we'll have examples of things where you might have the whole screen scrolling, but parts of the page might scroll in different ways or they might have their own uh, way of behaving. Uh, we call this in in technical terms overflow. So 
as an example, um, I just press uh, Command Y or Control Y to show me all the elements that are here, including the hidden ones. You can see on this screen, the shop screen, uh, these panels have more content um, than what first appears, and these are just set as an auto layout. So I can I can potentially add another few items here, and they'll just automatically stack. Um, the problem is Figma doesn't know that I want this to scroll this way by default. So when I'm scrolling this page, I can't actually drag this across. Um, as far as Figma is concerned, this is something that I don't necessarily want people to see on the page. Um, so to fix that, you need to set the individual scrolling behaviors. Um, so if I select the thing that I want to scroll um, and I go to uh, overflow, um, I can select this to be a horizontal overflow. Now, you'll notice when I do that at first, it gives me a little warning and it says for scrolling to work in this frame, the content needs to be bigger than the frame. And what Figma basically means is um, I have this frame and I'll just pull it out for, uh, for to show you clearly. I have this frame, this frame is this size. So according to Figma, there's nothing to scroll here. Like you have the whole thing here. It doesn't actually understand that you want this to scroll in the context of this frame. So there's two ways to tackle this. And if I've set my auto layouts up properly, I can just set this frame to fill and it's going to just fit to the screen boundaries that I've set. So in this case, um, this whole screen has a padding value of 24. So anything inside the screen, and I'll, I'll just put an outline to really highlight what I'm talking about. Um, anything inside this frame will fit inside a 24 pixel padding. And so now I've set the frame size smaller to then what's to, to what's inside. So I still have these elements, but the frame itself is actually um, it's smaller. And if I click clip content, it'll actually cut off what's inside the frame. And so you can see that's the actual size of the box. Now I don't want it to clip content because I want people to see that there's stuff happening further out here. Um, so now that I set this frame a little bit smaller than the contents inside, the warning for that overflow has disappeared. Now, now Figma will accept that, yes, there is stuff outside of this frame boundary um, that we can scroll. And so when I, I set that to horizontal, when I open the prototype, now when I drag this across, or I can use the scroll bar just like I would in a browser, I can actually drag this uh, content and I can, I can make this work like this. Um, and so I can scroll up and down this way. I can scroll back and forth this way. Um, this lets you have more of those kind of content real style uh, interactions or carousel interactions where there might be more than one thing happening at once and you need to maybe have individual sections that scroll. Um, the most creative application of this I've seen is a scrollable map where someone had a giant picture of a map and they put it inside a tiny frame and they said to Figma, this can scroll horizontally and vertically. And then you can have this interactive map, which you can actually move around Google Maps style. And that's really cool. Um, so I've, got, I've gotten a few more interactions here. Um, there's a few more things that you can do as well. Uh, so um, uh, you don't always have to drag a, you don't always have to drag uh, things to screens. Um, so uh, what I mean by that is, uh, let's say I have this terms and conditions link. Um, I can I can make I can make the uh, the page uh, scroll to the terms and conditions, um, but also what I can do and it's kind of niche, but there's some cases where it's useful. Um, I can actually copy the link to this uh, frame by pressing uh, Command L or Control L, um, and then uh, in this example, I can just uh, drag. Oops drag this to this frame and I can say on top, uh, open link. And if I paste that link um, and just make sure to untick the open a new tab, it will actually open that frame that I've linked. Um, so this can be kind of a useful way to move between pages of a file. Uh, it's kind of hacky, but let's say I had another set of screens um, that weren't in the context of this particular page. I can set a link to the screens on the next page and it will it will keep the prototype view or it'll open another prototype with those new set of screens but i don't have to send multiple links to people um that can be useful if you're maybe needing to show a transition from a mobile to browser view 
Um, you can also open, you can also set it to open regular URLs. So if you maybe had an external link in a prototype, you can actually set that external link so that it would open in a browser just like it would uh, if you were looking at something on a, a mobile app that was an external link. So it's a nice little feature. So I'm conscious I've, I've, I've gone through the basics uh, quite a bit there. Um, there are more things that I can cover, but um, I would like to just go through a few uh, useful examples um, that Figma actually provide. And I would really recommend you check out Figma's own videos and files because they always have really useful examples. Um, so I've covered some of these basic examples already. Um, so basics and scrolling, transitions. But uh, Smart Animate's one that I wanted to cover because I think Smart Animate is something that's kind of misunderstood by people who use it. Um, so Smart Animate is a feature in Figma that will try to smoothly move between uh, two things. And it usually works best if you have a component which maybe has two variants. Um, or you have a component that's on two screens, but maybe the component changes on the second screen. So in the example that Figma give, um, they have this sort of Instagram style panel that when it's clicked, it, it opens up to this um, wider view. So in this example, if I open it, oh, and I, I didn't set a device type, so it's going to open up the full screen. So if I set something like this, there we go. Um, when I click this, if I were to, and I'll just turn this back to instant. If I were to just click this normally, it would just pop open like this, right? Um, but I actually want this to do something more clever than that. So I'll actually show what I've done here. So I, I'll take this component and I'll just copy it to the next page. Um, and then what I'll do is uh, just, I'm just gonna hold the option key and just drag it to expand. And this component's already been set up so that this image is set to fill whatever size this component is. Um, because these two are the same components, Figma has an understanding of what these two are. Um, it has enough information to interpret what I'm trying to do if I pick Smart Animate. So if I select um, on top, uh, navigate to this screen, and I select the transition as Smart Animate, um, and I'll just select a, a long time for this duration here. Um, when I click this uh, screen, you'll see that it does this natural transition from this size to this size. Now, that only works if the layer structure of the two elements are the same. And this is where I see a lot of people uh, going wrong. So let's say it's a case where, let's just do an example. Um, I have a component here, or I've, I just detached it. I have this element here, um, and maybe it's a case where, I'll just close this. Um, Maybe it's the case where I want I want the image to appear when I click this. So I'm I'm getting excited thinking about this. I'm just going to copy this uh, here. I'm going to take this picture and drag it in here, and then set that to put the container. So I, I'm I'm basically hoping that when I uh, do a smart animate, that Figma's uh, going to go whoosh, and it may do that. We'll see. Um, I'm hoping it doesn't. So I can highlight my my what I'm trying to prove here. Um, so if I click this, oh, I haven't set the uh, interaction. If I select this, I want this to change to this. You'll see it's it's kind of interpreted it wrong. So um, I have this set to Smart Animate, but instead of opening up the image, it's kind of gone, ooh, I'm gonna pull this up here. And that's partly because an image didn't exist in this panel, and it certainly did exist in this panel, and Figma's confused. It doesn't know where this image has come from. It has no context of what it's trying to do. All it sees is that this thing is not like this thing. There's a slight difference in the layers. Um, so it's very important that if you're trying to if you're trying to do these kind of smart animate uh, elements, that you start off with two of the exact same element, and the only changes you should be doing are changes to the way the layer appears. Um, you shouldn't be removing elements, deleting elements. So in this case, I'm going to set the height of the image to zero here. Um, it might also work if I select it, uh, select it to hide, but I'm just going to set it to uh, zero. And probably actually, oh, it's setting it to one. Well, there's probably another way to do it, but for now I'm going to do it like this. So 
I'm going to replace that with that, and I'm going to replace this with this. So in terms of the layer structure, they're exactly the same. So Figma has enough information to know that if I'm saying, um, when I click this, uh, smart animate to this, oh, it didn't work, damn. Okay, maybe not. So smart animate is temperamental. Um, maybe if I try to do it like this. Hmm, not gonna spend too long on this. No, okay, I can't get it to work. Um, so Smart Animate Temperamental, uh, it works in specific conditions. In this case, it's not doing what I wanted it to do. Probably if I toyed around with it, I can get it to expand like that. Um, but, the but if you don't have the layer structure the same, it's never gonna work. Um, so make sure that they are the same structure. And preferably if you're using components, you can't actually delete uh, elements in variants, so that's a good place to start. I'm really annoyed that didn't work, actually. Um, but that's just the way prototyping works, particularly for things like Smart Animate. There's a lot of guessing happening. Um, um, there's a, another thing that actually is useful that I just remembered. Um, let's say that in this example, um, I have a button for settings. Now, uh, it, could be that, um, it could be that I want the settings panel to open up a settings page um but maybe i wanted to go back um, and when it goes back i wanted to go back to the page i was on and um, so there are two ways to do this um so if i include a, a back page up here um often what i see people do is um they'll do something like they'll see uh maybe they'll have a component for this um which is always a good thing to do so They'll set a component, which is a smart thing to do, called uh, mobile nav. And they'll have, they'll say, when I click this cog, go in the settings page. And then maybe they'll say, oh, um, when I click back, just, just go back to this page here. Um, and the problem with that is, and I'll just copy this in here. Um, and I'll just copy it in here as well, just to show. Um, when I click the settings button, uh, oops, I have that smart animating. Uh, that's another thing. Figma will remember the last animation you did. So if you were smart animating something, make sure to set it back to uh, the previous animation. Um, so if I'm on the screen and I click the settings button, it will just go to settings. And if I click back, um, it will go back to um, the previous screen. I'm just going to get rid of that smart animate. It's annoying as hell. Um, but the problem is, if I went onto the next screen, um, so I just set a, oh, it's a, ch it's a checkbox, yeah. The, yeah, the cart. So if I click the cart and then I click the settings page, I'm on settings and I click back, I'm suddenly not on the page I was originally on. Um, so when you want something to go back to the previous page, um, there's a special interaction that you can use called uh, on tap back. And so when you set something as a back interaction, it's always going to go back to the screen you were on previously. Um, and that's usually the best way to handle uh, any kind of back action unless you specifically want back to go somewhere. Uh, so now if if I um, if I go to the screen here, if I click settings and I go back, it's back on this screen. Um, and if I'm on this screen here and I click settings and I go back, it's gonna go back onto the screen I was on. Um, there's another way you can do that, um, which is, uh, and this is, uh, I think there's a specific example on the, the page here. Um, if you put your screens into a section, um, it will treat that section as its own little pocket. And this is really useful if you maybe have something like a photo gallery and you you move you want it so that someone can move away from that gallery, but when they click it again, they start again where they were. In this case, they're using it to highlight um, stories in an Instagram app. So typically, when you click a store, someone's story, um, you might exit their story, but when you resume, you don't want to see the first story again. You want to start from the story you were on. And so, if you put all the screens that you want in a section, it treats that section as its own little memory bank. So. If you leave a page, if you leave one of the pages in the section, it remembers that 
when you try to enter the section again, you were on this page last. And so if I click here and I click the story uh, of cute dogs and I decide to exit this and I'm playing around, if I go back in here, it's going to remember, oh, yeah, you were here last. Um, that's a really nice way of uh, kind of having a, uh, having memory inside Figma or state management. Um, so maybe you maybe you don't want something to keep resetting um, when you click the interaction. Now you can also uh, have it specifically reset um, when you when you do that. Um, uh, so in that in that interaction, uh, I believe yeah, uh, there's a tick box here called reset component state. So if it's a case where you specifically want something that's uh, changed to reset back to its original state, when you select that for elements, it will always go back to the default state. So for example, you could have an element that maybe is an accordion that opens, um, and then you move on to another screen, you go back and the accordion still open. Maybe you want it to be that every time someone goes back onto that previous page, you want all the things to reset. So that's another feature that you can use. Um, and, and, and really, um, there's so many of these things that I want to cover, but it's just so hard to cover all the prototyping details. Um, has anyone got any specific questions around interactions so far? Because I, I could I could spend like three hours easily on this section alone, but I'm conscious I don't want to, uh, I don't want to spend forever on it. Is there anything that I've missed or anything that maybe someone's having trouble with? And if not, that's okay. Probably not, or maybe? No, I guess, yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, um, yeah. I think the, the thing is, um, I find when you're working with, pro you may not think of that you have problems now, but there's always gonna be a case where you're working on prototypes and you have a specific interaction that you realize, oh, that's that's not working the way I thought it is. Um, and and the, best, the best thing to do, yeah, clear. Sorry, really quick. It's just something that mm. I um, and I heard you touch on it a few times. Again, I'm pretty mm. new to Figma, so this might oh, yeah. be a very rudimentary question. But can you talk a little bit about the differences between sort of sections and frames and how they interact oh, gosh, with yeah. each other in yeah. general in prototyping? Because that is something mm -hmm. that I am like struggling. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly pull out all the all the main ones. Um, so we have sections, we have frames, uh, we have groups, and we have auto layout frames. Um, these are kind of the main, the main four kind of container types. And it's it's very you'll you'll notice actually um, you probably notice this in a lot of files, particularly older Figma files in the community libraries. That people are using like frames and groups for everything, um, and then sometimes they're using auto layout for everything, and it's kind of it's not really clear what exactly the, all these things are for. Um, so the I guess at a high level, uh, to one extent, you could argue that it doesn't really matter what they are if they're achieving a goal. But in my opinion, if you want to design well and you want to design fast there's kind of a hierarchy of how much you should use these things. So sections are really useful for just highlighting a group of similar screens. Um, so this, uh, for example, I'm just gonna move back to the design panel. Um, this is a prototype file, right? So I don't care about how messy I'm being. I'm just like pulling things around. I've got like all these scrappy little temporary components. Um, but as, I, as things get more complex or as I'm kind of group, uh, moving things around, I might want to create some structure to this file. Or in the case of that example we showed, there might be a specific set of screens that have a relationship to each other where I wanted to remember what screen it was on. Um, I always use sections as a way to just group screens that are similar together. Um, so you can quickly go into sections by pressing Shift S. Um, and sections are just a way, and I'll just go to a real life example. Oh crap, I don't have the real life example open. Um, I don't think, oh wait, no, they're, they're here. Um, so in this example of like a design file that I have, I'm using sections to show like, this is a particular screen and these are the variants of that screen. This is another type of screen. This is another type of screen. And sections are a way for really at a high level for you to show like these screens have a relationship to each other. They're part of a flow or they're part of maybe multiple views of the same screen. And so in this case, 
I might have a section called onboarding and then I might have a section called shop and as I expand the prototype or as I expand the design there's almost certainly going to be multiple screens associated with this section and um, so it could be that there's like um, a shop page here and then maybe shop with filters um, see all products and that would all be under the category shop and um, so that's really how I use sections they're just a great way of demarcating uh, different sets of screens and they have that added value in a prototype of kind of holding position of whatever screen you're on like that Instagram stories example um, and then frames I would consider to be the top level component um, so you can use frames everywhere but I would typically always use frames for the top layer and try not to use frames anywhere else um, so, and so and Figma also kind of encourages this because when you press the frames icon it's specifically saying like um, select a device type or select, you know, a presentation type. Figma kind of wants you to pick that top level frame. Um, in, in Adobe, like, they use artboards and artboards are just these, like, top level layers to give shape to things. You wouldn't, like, have multiple artboards inside an artboard. That would be weird. And while you can have frames inside frames, apart from really specific examples, I would try to avoid it. And the nice thing about frames also um, is, uh, they will let you um, constrain things to them. So as I said in that previous example, um, if I have something like this nav bar element and I have it to the bottom, I have this constraints option. I don't have that in other layer types. Like uh, if I have an auto layout layer, I don't have that constraints option when I select this um, because auto layouts are dynamic whereas frames are fixed. So having like this fixed top with dynamic things underneath is the best way to design. So kind of going off that idea, and I'm just, I'm pressing shift I to open my components here and just gonna grab some buttons. And um, let's say I have a page here with some buttons and an element up here. Um, typically what I would always try to do um, when I'm constructing uh, interface elements, actually it's probably better that I just pull a, a complete example. I don't know why I'm doing it from scratch. Um, I try to always have, a, and, and you can see if, if you follow me here on the left hand side, um, I try to always have a, a frame on the top and then an auto layout as soon as I can inside the, uh, the content. And the advantage of an auto layout uh, is basically it's like a frame, but instead of it being fixed, it's dynamic. So you can have things automatically uh, packed together with each other. You can have them spread apart. So the really nice thing is if, for example, if, if this was a frame, and so we'll just we'll just make this a frame, right? Um, I, if I try to duplicate this layer, it's not automatically spacing out. In fact, none of these layers have a relationship to each other in a frame. A frame is just this fixed thing. It doesn't know to do with these layers. Um, whereas if I have these layers in an auto layout, and I'll, I'll just uh, highlight this, um, an auto layout is like basically how most things in any interface work. Typically, you don't want to manually place elements. You have some concept of they're stacked somehow. And with an auto layout layer, um, I can set rules. So in this case, I have these elements in an auto layout layer that they're going across and they're spaced this much apart and they're aligned on the top left. I can quickly set it to that. Um, whoops. I can quickly uh, set it so that they're like this, or they're like this, or maybe um, I want them to wrap so that if, if that uh, gets narrower, these will automatically know to like go down to the next layer. The point of this is I don't have to think about where these are positioned. I don't have to go in here and go, oh, I have to move all these like just a little to the left to make that work. Here, I'm just like, da, 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 da. I've got all these items and I don't care and I haven't got time. Um, and so when you combine auto layouts, um, you can have things like all these elements go down, but inside here, all these elements go this way. And maybe in here, the um, I want these two to be together, but these two to be spaced apart. Uh, in terms of groups, that's the last uh, category here. Groups are a bit of a weird one, and I would try to avoid using groups unless you're really pressed for time, or if you're making icons. Um, so, uh, these are not great examples, but if you're making a, a, your own custom icon and you've got lots of little vectors, um, in fact, I might be able to just get an example if I open up Phosphor. 
there's a plugin I always use called Phosphor Icons for icon sets. Um, if I pull an icon like this, you can see that it's consisting of all of these different uh, pieces. A group would be a valid way of making sure that these are all part of one set. But then again, so is a frame. I find the only thing I ever use a group for now is, um, and I might have an example. Um, in this example, I've got a set of annotations. And by default, there's always a title on top of the, the layer. Uh, if that's a group that doesn't have a title on top of the layer. And so I know what it's called, but it's not like annoying people with the title. That's probably the only time I've ever found groups useful. I would kind of avoid using groups otherwise, unless you've got a specific reason. Um, so kind of to answer that question, sections for grouping frames, frames as your top level, and auto layouts for basically anything that you can use an auto layout for. Um, and, and it's kind of like, a, it's kind of like a, a food pyramid of like how much you should use each one, if you know what I mean? Does that, does that make it clear? It kind of comes with practice as well, you know? Yeah, I think I think coming for, for myself as well, coming from Adobe into Figma, I was, again, some stuff was kind of instinctual, like using a frame as an artboard, but I was, yeah. I had no idea what I was doing. Like I've been grouping everything. <laughs> <laughs> so like my uh, nightmare is like uh opening up a file and this happened i i um i worked with someone once who was a junior and and they were really good at what they did um but by god like i would open up a figma file and everything here would be a frame or a group and i i just clicked something here thinking oh i actually don't want this and normally i just press delete and it would just remove it and i wouldn't have to think about it but in this case everything was positioned like absolutely on the page so i get rid of this and it would look like this and i suddenly have to kind of drag everything back into place and suddenly i've wasted an hour that i could have spent doing something useful um so really it's just about it's partly like i'm, I'm it's probably just about automating things right yeah. so if you do the layer structures right and use the right types of uh, groups you're just taking that extra work away from yourself you know yeah I that's brilliant. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate oh, it. Oh, not at all. And, and and I'll be here for a little while at the end if you want to kind of cover any specific examples. Um, so let me take a look at my list. I even actually set a checklist for myself because I'm terrible at remembering what, what I'm doing. Um, so we've done we've done our lot here. Uh, we've done some pitfalls, interaction, common patterns. Uh, don't repeat yourself. So the last thing that I want to cover. And I can only really cover it at a high level because even I struggle with this a little. Is um, let's say, um, and we'll start with this example. Uh, let's say you've you set up all your interactions, and you've even maybe like you've you've made this a component so that like all these little details tidy themselves and everything's perfect. Um, and then you get a comment from a stakeholder or user saying. Oh, but this is like this is not real, or or like this is fake. Like you you have a fake adding to cart that does nothing, um, and then you have these set prices, and you can't really actually see what happens when you add things or when you remove things. And in yes, you could probably like you could make a screen for every single type of interaction that can happen, but you're going to end up with like dozens and dozens of screens. So there's I'm going to cover how to use variables uh, very briefly. Um, so I, pre I prepared some examples. Um, so uh, in the first example, um, we have this uh, simple kind of news feed style app where at the start it asks you what topics you're interested in. And, and again, we've planned this out before we started prototyping. So the idea in our head is um, we want it so that when you select like music, uh, it, it'll load and then it'll only show me articles about music. Now, the old way of doing that in Figma used to be that you have to think of every single combination of that component, right? So you'd have to think of like, I think there's 16 different variants here. And then you'd have to have every single result of that output. And you can do that. And if you're good at Figma, it won't take you forever. But then you find out that, oh, we needed a fifth uh, topic. Or, oh, can we change that screen a little bit? And you realize, oh, crap, I have to like, I have to edit like, 20 different, 30 different screens. And I've literally, I, I, I remember working with a component that was just five radio buttons and it had like 50 interactions or something because that was the only way you could simulate it doing stuff. And that was a nightmare. But we don't have to do that anymore with um, variables and advanced prototyping. 
Um, so the only the only thing I will say is you have to have a paid plan to use this feature. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm bunking off my work account right now. Don't tell them. Uh, <laughs> um, when you have when you have a paid feature in Figma, um, you have an you have an additional option um, available that when you when you select an element, and um, we'll just get rid of the oh we'll get rid of the existing interactions. Or what was what was actually that interaction? Ah, okay. We probably shouldn't get rid of that interaction. That's another thing, by the way. If you can set interactions in a component, but then when you put a component in here, you have to remember that there is an interaction here. And if you add a new interaction, it's going to get rid of the one that was there before. And it'll tell you that with a little warning symbol. So I'm get, going to get rid of that one I had. Um, so I want this to work so that um, when I click music, something is set that it remembers that I selected music. And somehow on this side, it knows that these things are music things and to only show those things. Um, so this is where it, if you haven't done any kind of coding before, this might be awfully scary and terrifying, but it's it's really not so bad and you'll get better the more you practice. Um, when I go into my design panel um, and I click local variables, uh, I've set up a few variables already. Um, so again, write this out in paper before you start doing this. Don't try to do this on the fly. I, I've i kind of thought about, I want something that says like it has music and I want that to be either false or true and the same for these buttons. So basically what I'm saying is, does this have music, true or false? Does this have food, true or false? And that's kind of my starting point, right? Um, and then once I set those variables, um, what I can do is, um, I, I want this uh, to be so that when I click it, it's changing that does it have music to true. Um, so in my interactions, if I select the plus button and I select set variable, uh, I can say, uh, hey, uh, when, when on top, set this variable has music to true. And so what that will do is when I click this, it's gonna set it to true. Um, and for now, I'm not I'm not caring about toggling it on and off. I'm I'm just doing a simple test, um, and then the the thing I want after at the end is that thing is going to say it has music and it's going to set something a switch to on that says show me the articles with music. I but I need to tell Figma what that means. Um, so I already have this variable called has music. I don't need to make another variable. Everything can everything can basically read off this. So. The idea is if this switch has been switched on by a button, then the music articles will, will display. Um, so what I can do is I just have to find the music articles here. Um, oh, this is challenging. There we go. So there's one here. There's one here. And there's one here. So there's four music uh, elements. This is a really obscure thing if you don't already know how to do it, and I really hope Figma improves it. But you can set the visibility of the layer based on a variable, and it is really obscure how you do it. You have to go to the layer panel, and you have to right-click the eye. And when you right-click the eye, it pops up a dialogue saying, like, what variable do you want this to be associated with? And I really wish they'd use the little cube icon, but they don't, and I've complained about it. So many times, please listen, Figma. Um, so I want this to say, um, has music, uh, show this or don't show it. And you'll notice that as soon as I click that, this disappears. Why does that disappear? It's because has music is false. If I go into this and set it to true, you'll see that these appear. Um, and now you're start I'm hoping now it's starting to click where it's like, oh, I click this button to make it appear, and then it'll appear here. And so if I do the same, um, and I'll, I'll, in this example, I'll just pretend everything else is food. Um, so if I select all these um, all these things, or maybe I'll just maybe I'll just deselect these three, um, and I'll say that has food, and maybe I'll just pretend that these are design articles, even though I know that's a food article, um, and I'll say these three are design articles. Now there's nothing on the page, right? Um, now they're, they're still there, but they're, they're right now reading that variable and that variable saying hide this. And um, so all I have to do is just add that interaction 
and again, if I copy this and paste it here, um, I can just speed that up a bit for myself. So I already set this, I already set this uh, property. So all I have to do is change the variable. I do not have the time again to be like on top, set variable, set this, set true. I just, I know what I want it to do. I just need to set what it's doing. And so again, I paste that interaction and make sure that says has design. Um, and I'm hoping this interaction that uh, will still work. So to just recap, I've done two things, three things actually. Um, I first, okay, four things actually. I first didn't use Figma. I first sat down with pen and paper or a whiteboard and actually drew out a flow of like what I wanted to do because don't you should not try to juggle all this in your head. You should like have a flow diagram of, is this clicked? Then set this. Is that clicked? Then set that. Because then when you go to put it in Figma, it's much easier. Um, and so then I have this, like, I, I have these four buttons, and I just named them based on how developers typically name uh, variables, which is called camel case, because it's humpy. So uh, lowercase, and then each word is a, a top letter. That's just a developer thing. Um, you can actually do whatever you want, but it might help if you do if you use the same conventions. Um, so I have these four variables, and I have them set that, no, don't show this for now, because nothing is selected. And then the, the next thing is, um, I want the I set these buttons so that each of these buttons will turn this on. Now I can just without a fear of confusing you completely. Um, I can actually set this so that uh, if has music is false. Um, oops. If has music is false, then set has music to true. Um, to true. But if has music is already true, which is like if it's not this, then set has music to uh, false, and that's a toggle uh, basically. And and again, that might seem terrifying if you haven't coded before. But if you ever get into coding, you'll see this kind of thing a lot. So it's like if this is this, do this, and if it's not this, do this. So that's basically me saying if it's off, turn it on. If it's on, turn it off. And hopefully that works. So we'll open up this prototype. Um, so I can see that it's turning on and off. And one thing that I can do, um, which is some, sometimes how I test the variables are working, is I'll, I'll just make this uh, down, thing down here. And I'll set the visibility of this layer to has music. And it's going to vanish. Now, if I set this to true, that should appear. And so I know it's working. right? So I click this button, and it's saying, hey, like, make sure this appears anywhere that it has has music. And so if I were to continue here with no thing selected, um, it's going to have nothing for me. Uh, if I select music and click continue, it's only going to have the music articles that I set. And if I set more than one thing, it's going to combine those. So now you have, you have a working filter that's relatively simple. It's not too complex, right? Um, you can hide and show things in different combinations. And again, I only have three screens. I have no variance of the screen. Um, so this is an amazing feature. Um, this is something that I, it's just not, I don't think it's utilized enough, partly because it's a little scary at the start. But you can do things like setting filters in an e-commerce app and actually having those filters align with items. And then when someone's using the app, you can actually test those filters. And you're, not, you're saving yourself hours of time in terms of like, not having to draw out all these screens. And I don't have time, I'm afraid, to, to fully cover this. Um, but you can also do maths. Um, so I haven't set up this prototype. But um, just as an example, I could create variables for this. So um, let's. I'll start a. I'll set a new set of variables. So, oops, not that. Uh, I'll set a number variable called price. Uh, apples, and then I can set that variable as 350 or 3.5. And then when I go in here, uh, I can set the content of this to whatever I've set as a variable. And typically, that icon looks like a 3D cube or a hexagon. And if I select that, it's going to say 350. And the only thing I have to add then is, um, oops is just a euro symbol, which would be separate to the variable, and they can just have those beside each other. And now if I set that to 7, it's going to update to 7. Um, 
And then uh, what you can do is you can do things like um, maybe this variable is um, apples times three. Uh, and maybe these buttons is like every time I click this, add the apples price to the total. And then maybe when the the total, and you can have a variable for the total. And maybe when the total is bigger than 30 euro, the delivery becomes zero and you pop up a little thing saying you get free delivery. These are all the things that are possible when you start diving into variables. Uh, and there are there are a lot of working examples that Figma have published both on YouTube and in their community folder. Um, if there's an interest in, in diving into that more, I'd be happy to chat to a few people. Please reach out to me if you want to, to specifically talk about variables and prototypes. But I won't go deeper than that because it gets it gets pretty gnarly. Um, but just know that if you do want those kind of conditional and logic examples, you can do that in Figma to an extent. Uh, you still can't do certain things like text input. Um, I believe that's coming uh, later this year or maybe early next year. I really hope it does because that would be that would really like complete the circle in terms of all the things that you need for a more realistic prototype. Um, you, there are also going to be more variables for setting fonts and setting other kind of characteristics. So there may be ways to play around with that. Um, but I'm hoping at least at this point, you have some questions answered, answered around variables, around how to lay out your files, how to save yourself time, because ultimately Figma is a tool. And I don't want anyone spending 40 hours of their week as a Figma wizard. It's not going to serve you in the long term. Uh, you really need to spend that time focusing on problems and using Figma to just communicate those problems, right? Um, but it's still a really powerful tool. Um, and I would just, I would really recommend like, set, find some screens or maybe take a set of your own screens and start practicing with those different techniques. Maybe have an accordion that expands, try a drop down menu, try a modal that pops up um, that you can scroll through, try a Google Maps app, you know? Um, and just go wild because there are some really creative examples out there, particularly in the community. Um, so I'm I'm running towards the end of my time. So I'm going to take this section as a general Q and A. Um, if anyone if anyone needs to drop off, uh, please feel free to do so. But I'd love to help you if there's any specific examples that I can I can help you figure out. Does anyone any have any questions or any feedback for Jamie here, guys? Um, I, I do actually have a quick question, uh, Jamie. Yeah. Thanks a million for that. That was really useful. <laughs> and I was I was very so, happy to hear that you said the uh, copy and paste uh, interaction was a new feature. Because it's like, oh no, yeah. <laughs> How long have I not been doing that for? <laughs> but uh, what I was going to ask is, um, and you, you literally just made reference to it there, um, the text input thing. So mm. like. I mean, when you were talking about the use cases for prototypes at the start, we were kind of, you can, we can use it for ourselves to test things out, test it, like uh, demonstrate to stakeholders, get buy in, and and for conversations with developers and everything. And that's for sure uh, really, really useful. But they're internal audiences. So, like any of those kind of limitations that you start to run into, you can have a conversation with them. But we, yeah. we've kind of used Figma for user testing as well. So, there's less. Mm of an opportunity there or kind of a less of an understanding uh, that from the, the users as to what the limitations are. And yeah. so we kind of start running into those, like like mm -hmm. uh, trying to demonstrate like an input, like text input or numerical input and things like that. Um, and I was just wondering if you'd like, if, if you've run into those types of issues as well with testing yeah. and what, like would you jump to protopie or would you go to code like for a, proof of concept or would you just kind of be like okay well you know how a text input feel <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, I, I, okay i'll be i'll be perfectly honest i've been lucky enough that i've only had to use protopie once for something um when i read it was a it was actually not for for the company i'm working with now it was for a b2b SaaS application and in those kinds of applications you really do need to simulate more complex inter interactions sorry um but uh, I have had a stakeholder uh, describe Figma prototyping as sort of like a souped up PowerPoint. I had to laugh at it is. <laughs> it is now it's gotten better, but up until variables came out, it was a souped up PowerPoint. It was just like when you click here, it goes to this screen. When you click here, it goes to that screen, and it's like a bit wooshy, but it's, it's basically the same thing. Um, 
there are there are creative ways you can overcome some of those uh, limitations. Um, so often, and I've just come to this screen to kind of give you an example. Um, often, what I do for text inputs to simulate an input, um, although it's still not perfect, is um, what I'll do is um, I. I'm sorry about the names of these uh, frames, by the way. Um, I'll just call that default and active. Um, or maybe default hover build. So what I would typically do, and this is where it can get a bit gnarly if you've got lots and lots of inputs, but you can do it this way, is um, I will I will set uh, I will set three variants of an input form field, or maybe I have a, an input form field composed already that I can just pull in and mess around with. Uh, but in this case, I'll I'll get these three, and uh, I'll drag them all together. And I'll create a component set, which basically just uh, shortcuts me having to make variants. So when I do that, it's just going to say this is a component, and I'm going to call it form field. Uh, and all the all the things inside here are variants, and and variants basically means these are versions of the component. And um, so re uh, and this is actually going to another prototyping feature I didn't get to cover properly, which is super powerful. Um, which is you can actually move between these variants inside the uh, inside the frame without actually moving away from the screen. Um, so to simulate a text input, I'll typically do something like, uh, I don't know, let's say, um, I'll have like a default view here, I'll have a hover view, and then a filled in view. And obviously, we can't, can't simulate that text input here. Um, if you're really fancy, you can do like a little fancy, like a dissolve transition where it, like, uh, kind of wipes uh, from the left, so it looks like it's typing, but I think that's a bit not necessary. People don't really care for this kind of thing. Um, so what I'll do is I'll make this set. I'll set this so on um, while hovering, and this means when I'm hovering over this, it'll ch uh, change to this. So if you do this inside a component with variants, the default action is not navigate anymore. It's change to. That's a, an important distinction. So it's changing from this to this. Um, and so while it's on this and uh, someone interacts with it, I want it to change to this. Uh, you can you can set it so that uh, potentially someone types a letter. Um, so maybe they type S, and by typing S, it fills in. I would avoid doing that because you're not giving anyone an indication that they have to type that specific letter. Although um, one fun thing that I did when I was doing more advanced prototypes was I would have a I would have an error state on this form field and and for to show devs I would say on any of these form fields if you press E it will render an error so you can see what errors look like in context but that's that's kind of a very specific case and um, typically what I will do is I will say when you tap this form field because we know everyone's going to click a form field instinctively um, fill in this input. And so if I take this component and I just put it here, and oh, by the way, um, oh, I don't know if this still works. Yeah, it does. Um, you can either press Command Shift R uh, to replace an existing component on the on the spot, or the old school command is um, uh, Command Option Shift V, which is like how it used to be. And they removed that shortcut in one update, and everyone got really upset, so they brought it back in. Um, that would that that's a really fast way, just like replacing an element with something else, so you don't have to mess around with like jumping it in and deleting stuff. And um, so anyway, uh, I put this in here. I've said everything I want it to do, and hopefully it works. So here, when I hover over this, um, I can see that oh, and there's something interactive here. And then when I click it, it fills in details. And you could even you could even set an interaction, uh, for example, so that um, when they when they hit the Backspace key, um, it will delete that. But just be careful with that because if you have multiple elements with that interaction, by pressing the backspace key, it may not function the way you think it will. Um, but you can see if you have like um, many of these inputs, right? Uh, there we go. Um, if you have many of these inputs, like a form, you can just simply click through them and it at least gives a representation of. This is you filling in your details. And you can also work that with variables so that you can't continue until they filled in all the details. Um, 
Or you can create, if you want to be really hacky, you can create a component that has everything contained in here and has a state that only when these are all clicked, you can continue. I found that's good enough for basic prototypes. Yeah. Um, it's Because remember, a prototype is just a, it's just a sketch. You're just trying to answer a question. And typically, these would be like low to medium fidelity prototypes. Uh, you're really just trying to use a Figma prototype to answer a question about a specific thing. You don't want to use a prototype to like test out an entire experience. Um, at that stage, if you're getting to that stage, that's when you need to start think, talking to your team, talking to whoever you're working with about, let's put together a scrappy MVP, because then you're bringing in all the real life stuff and all the real life data um, and more complex interactions. Because people might be viewing it in different screens at that point, and you need to test different conditions. This is the pure purpose of a prototype, particularly in Figma, is just to get a sense of, do people understand what this is? Do people understand how this works? Are people instinctively moving to things that I want them to move to? Um, and then the, um, you can use, there are tools like Maze, which actually has gotten a bit more expensive, but there are tools like Maze, which will let you import a Figma prototype and give you like a basic heat map, which can be a really cool, low fidelity way of checking like, does everyone instinctively click like up here for a certain option when you ask them to? Or do people just click everywhere and get lost? And I've I've been given prototypes to test where I literally had no idea what was going on. And that answered the question for that person, right? Um, so there's always a hacky way to do it in Figma. And another thing that's quite important, um, if you're working in a file uh, where there's a prototype alongside uh, regular uh, pages, and you happen to be publishing this file because you want to publish the components, make sure to always name your component as, I use the I use this naming file, I always call it .proto and then form field. Um, so that's there's two things there. Um, typing proto at the start of any component tells me straight away, this is not for like specs. This is just a hacky version of a component that I've made just for this prototype. And putting a, a full stop at the start of any component automatically tells Figma, don't publish this component ever. Um, so you can't accidentally pull in like the, the crappy prototype version of a form field when you wanted the real working one. Um, that's another kind of side note. Um, yeah, that, but, that proto thing is very handy. <laughs> yeah, because I, I used to not do that. And I didn't understand why I kept pulling in like this weird version of the form field that didn't behave properly and it's sized all wrong. Because it turns out I had a, I made a really scrappy version of it just for a hacky prototype. Um, but that kind of helps you contain things. But I, in general, I would always suggest outside of a prototype file or a rough sketch, try to keep your components in a separate library file altogether. Because that way you just won't you won't come into that problem. Um, yeah, like that's only one example. Like it's a similar case with stuff like drop downs. So like uh, with a drop down. You can open an overlay that's a rectangle with options. You can have each of those options either set a variable in text box or maybe set a version of the text box with that selected. Um, drop down are a bit nicer because you know what the answers are. So you can work with that, especially with variables. Um, but with text inputs, I would just say, because you're doing low fidelity, just do defaults, like have general names, general options, um, unless you're, when it comes, unless you're specifically trying to like error diagnose something uh, or trying to look at different validation rules, that's when I'd say literally just get a HTML file and like learn how to make an input um, because you can get a lot more out of just doing that. Get Go into CodePen mm -hmm. and look at a tutorial or two or take a template and just edit it a little bit. But then you're getting into the developer side of things. So it's, it's depending on your comfort level, right? Yeah, cool. Now that, that makes sense. Thanks for that. Yeah, no worries. That's great. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Jamie. Um, anyone else? Any questions? That was great, Jamie. I think you, you covered, like you touched base on a kind of beginner level, but also covered a lot of intermediate and also like some advanced stuff in, in Figma. Yeah. I, I think you kind of satisfy the audience like at every level of Figma knowledge. So that's great. Um, guys, do you have any questions for Jamie in, in relation to say like, you know, any kind of bugs that you noticed while prototyping or anything 
related to maybe the structure of your prototype, like on the screen. I'm, I don't know, I'm just kind of shooting the ideas now, if anyone had anything. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, I can tell you one one book that I know of that might be helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I, I come, I've come across it sometimes and it's rather annoying. Um, which is, uh, I actually experienced it today when I was playing, I was just playing around with this in the, the slides. I was playing around with like on hover, I want these to bounce open. <clears throat> and at one point I I decided to change the component structure a little bit. Um, so if I, I'll just pull up a frame, for example. I don't know if I'll be able to recreate this, um, but I had this open in the inline preview and so I was like, ooh, playing around with it. Oh, that's cool. I'm going to like change some things around. So um, I don't know. I changed, I changed the font um, and maybe changed it to medium. And maybe I, I got rid of this and decided to try something again, or I pulled it in. Um, so I want this to like, oops, I want this to be like double size when I, when I hover over it. And I'll just like set a quick hover interaction. This might work, it might not. Okay, it does work. Um, sometimes I found, and I can't recreate it now, of course, when I'm trying to, but sometimes I found when I'm tweaking prototypes on the fly um, and I make a change, it doesn't, sometimes, and the inline preview, it kind of breaks. Um, so, so sometimes I found if I'm like changing the widths of things or I'm changing interactions, um, it doesn't update properly in the inline preview or the or the change that happens looks really hacky. And the problem is if I close and open the inline preview, it doesn't actually reset the prototype as in reload the whole thing from scratch. Um, I, I wish I could show you an example, but I, I don't think it will even appear in this file. Oh yeah, so it actually, it, it's actually perfect, it worked. Um, you can see something's wrong here. So in the, in the, in the file, I clearly have these two components that are the same, they're the same font, but you notice if we're setting the, the thickness of the font when I'm hovering, um, and then pressing R to reset the prototype and closing it and opening it again. Um, but the thing is, if I go to present this, it, that doesn't happen. Um, see, it's working perfectly. So I would say if you're having that weird thing, because I know this is a relatively new feature, this inline prototype, where it's not really doing what I want, it's kind of behaving really irregularly the best thing to do is just close the file and open it because that will actually reload everything um it's a bug and i, I think it's been reported but like, if you find if you find your prototype is not working the way you think it is it may not be you um and just to make sure to open it with the present page so it opens in a new tab to double check because that will always reset the prototype it's a bit specific but i it drove me crazy for a while <laughs> Very good. Um, did anyone think of anything in the meantime now, guys? Um, you can always reach out to me, uh, yeah. by the way, if you have anything specific. Um, I'm not perfect at this, but I've gotten pretty good over time. So I, I think I've effed up in every way imaginable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I know, I know, I know how it works. Um, so yeah, I know. Do reach out to me. I know I, thinking on the spot is hard, and it's it's getting late um but yeah you can contact me jamie jamie or on linkedin or on slack if you happen to be part of the ux3 community um it's usually where i'm reachable and yeah I'll, I'll always try to help in whatever way i can very good thank you so much jamie thank you for your time thanks guys for for joining the call tonight i'll uh, stop recording now and i'll share the recording with everyone uh who attended the session and wider um anyways any questions reach out to jamie or reach out to myself it's if you have any other suggestions for webinars in the future thank you thanks a minute yeah, and, and thanks valentina um for having me no thank you thanks, <laughs> thanks, 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 thanks. bye-bye